Right. Seven o'clock. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to our last reading in the Practices of Hope series. I'm joining you today from up north Michigan, Odawa territory. And DJ and I were the editors for our Practices of Hope issue, assisted by Catherine Fairfield and Rebecca Sanchez. Practices of Hope. This is the framework for our About Place issue and for our reading series. The work on all this spanned the timeline of the pandemic so far, and our readings were beacons of hope for me and I think also for DJ, strangers merging their voices to speak about the many ways that joy, hope and critique can help us shape new futures. So tonight, before I hand the baton over to Jacqueline Johnson, our incoming About Place editor for the next issue, I want to mark three moments. I want to mark 9-11. I had just been less than a week in my new host country, the USA, working as a, at a small business college, and I was in class when the first plane hit. Two of the college's students were on the Pentagon plane. Many students' relatives worked in the Twin Towers, and then... Many of the students vanished in the following weeks of the semester as the US became unsafe for them. Our international and domestic community stays diminished by prejudice and hate. I want to honor everybody who fought and fights to save the lives of others. And I want to send love and support to everybody who's dealing with the fires in the West. I want to honor this week's scholar strike and its mission to not let racial injustice become background noise in a white supremacist world. The wages of hate and the futures of hope need to stay central in our teaching, practice, and research. My own reading is dedicated to the striking graduate students at the University of Michigan who wish to see a safer campus for all with divestment from the police force and thoughtful COVID protection. <laughs> Lastly, in every one of our four readings, we have read under this banner, bringing together land, language, and honor, words first spoken and gifted to us by Margaret Newton, a Nishnabe poet in our May reading, Miigwech Meg. The words are Apidan Gojiwak Mekade Wijik, Black Lives Matter. And with this, I want to hand this over to Jacqueline Johnson to run the series for us. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you. I, I want to extend the thanks to you and DJ for creating the series and for modeling um, an example that the rest of us can follow as editors. Um, I bring you greetings from the heart of Brooklyn, um, formerly Lenape land. Um, and as a New Yorker, I, I do want to honor the sacrifice of those who lost their lives. Um, uh, 19 years ago. Um, I was actually, I actually saw the smoke of the first plane. I was like a block from the Brooklyn Promenade and did not realize what I was seeing. Um, maybe an hour later, I went out and felt the presence of ancestors flowing all around me as I looked through uh, or over New York Harbor. So I want to honor their memory today. Um, and I think I'm just going to go ahead and get us started. We have a, a really rich and wonderful panel. And I'd like to start with Orchid. Um, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about atmospheres and air, um, partly because um, uh, partly because of the cloudy air that happened after 9-11. And so I'm going to read a poem. Uh, called Ode to Surfaces Air, and it has two voices, uh, one that engages a landfill in Columbus, Ohio, which is now my adopted state, and a secondary voice containing found uh, texts uh, relating to the Belmont um, uh, methane explosion that happened in uh, 2018. Um, but I'm going to read predominantly from the first, uh, the first, the first voice, um, but I won't make any distinction between uh, either voices. Ode to Surfaces Air. I parked discreetly outside the former model landfill on the driveway close to the two lane road, far enough from the entrance to appear that I am lost. The landfill opened in 1967 and it was one of the first sanitary landfills to operate in Columbus, Ohio. Located off Jackson Pike and west of the Scotto River, which runs through the city, the model landfill was built during a period of intensive professionalization in the U.S. waste management industry. 
Seven years earlier, Columbus sanitation workers became uniformed employees of the newly organized division of sanitation for the first time in the city's history, military men. Their outfits were beautiful and cathedral, cathedral because they were beautiful men. The model landfill employed loving men. It covered 100 acres of industrial land and accepted commercial and residential wastes. It operated continuously until its former closure in 1985 and the Solid Waste Authority of Central Otago, SWACO, took over management of the site. The form of the land scattered in deeds and documents. SWACO leased the site to Phoenix Golf Links Limited Petro Environmental to construct a golf course over the capped landfill in 1999. This alliance between pleasure and bioremediation is a common green narrative that replicates similar urban engineering projects at Fresh Kills on Staten Island, Spectacle Island in Boston Harbor and Tift Nature Preserve in Buffalo. The Phoenix Link Golf Course opened in 2000 and at first blush it exemplified successful brownfield remediation. It was sweet and fitting. As Christopher Todd Anderson notes, quote, founding meaning in garbage requires a departure from the usual sites of human activity and a willingness to engage in the ambiguous space of the dumping ground or little feared. But waste, while waste reimagines the scales of human leisure and toxic traces of consumer culture, the ambiguous spaces of the model landfill are molecular and effervescent. I stay only for half a moment. My photographs of the site's entrance grasp the frame but ignore its death. None of us pay attention to what we can't see or measure. A creek spills brown water from a pipe at the base of the landfill. A heap of tie bottles in language, plastic shrimp, a tang of sewage and hardened veils of glass. These ghastly ears partially resist their enclosure. Methane is an incoherent lyrical subject odorless, invisible, unwinding wood wine. Methane migrates, withholding its burial. We've got it under control. We're managing it. In 1774, Benjamin Franklin wrote a letter to Joseph Presley, the discoverer of oxygen, about a mysterious and flammable gas found in woodlands and swamps. In that letter, Franklin described a second-hand, second-hand observations gleaned from amateur experiments he had overheard while passing through New Jersey. Quote, I heard it several times mentioned, he wrote, that by applying a lighted candle near the surface of some of their rivers, a sudden flame would catch and spread on the water, continuing to burn for near half a minute. A spark bears witness to frightful ears. A spark is not a surface. The integument had exposed itself. While Franklin noted that others had replicated these experiments, experiments he had been far less successful. It is reasonable to assume that this gas was none other than methane bubbling from New Jersey's herbetic bogs. Priestley later published their letter in experiments and observations on different kinds of air. Franklin's account of these magical flames ignited from the muddy surfaces of marsh water also inspired the Italian physicist Alessandro Volta to identify the ghostly substance. These ghastly airs partial and resistant. Volta managed to isolate methane from the marsh gas he had meticulously collected from Lago Maggiore, Italy's second largest lake in 1778. Unlike an ode, there is no straightforward story here. An ode is a surface, sweet and fitting. Naming conventions for this fiery air wouldn't become standardized until the 19th century when August William von Hoffmann, a German scientist, derived the name methane from methanol. A name is a kind of sticky surface. Methane is Greek scholarship. Classical odes are monstrous and rigid. Wetlands, marshes, and oceans are natural sinks of methane. Hydraulic fracking of the Marcella Shale, which covers an area from New York to the Appalachian Basin, releases fugitive methane emissions into the atmosphere. One study using plain language estimated a mean of a mean rate of 21 kilograms of methane from a 4,200 square kilometer study area. Data is form and knowledge. I don't know what this means. The release of gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling from organic surfaces like the surf sources like the Arctic permafrost is a terrifying contributor to global warming. Methane is greenhouse knowledge. And its emissions are also difficult to track since the gas has a tender lifespan of 9.1 years in the atmosphere compared to 100 years for carbon dioxide. But the global surface temperature is my skin. Methane brought me to the model landfill. This gas is a natural byproduct of decomposing garbage. Landfills are sentient and restless. Geological forces as dynamic as volcanoes. 
According to the Environmental Protection Agency, landfills account for 14.1% of methane emissions in the United States in 2017. The collection of methane or landfill gas is therefore vital to maintain healthy air quality, especially for residential and industrial areas that surround these modern wastelands. Vertical and horizontal pipes buried underneath landfill cells collect LFG and transport it to the processing facilities, where it is either burned off or converted into electricity heat or fuel for residential and commercial energy use. An archive discloses, methane defies the inefficiency of commodity culture. It is the retaliation of contagious rejected and a rejection of climate repair. I can't portrait, portrait this. This conversion process of methane underscores the transitory nature of landfills. Gaseous wastes are mobile, leaky, and porous commodities traveling far from the initial sites of deposit, returning back to cities, homes, and commercial spaces as ghastly vapor. Indeed, methane foregrounds how much wastes are not matter out of place, as Mary Douglas imagines, but are very much in place in urban society. The archive encloses. Landfills may be the sites of managed decay that naturally conserve wastes as corpses of menacing record, but methane resists these archival tendencies. Look at the surface. It is crooked and solid. It is impossible to write a poem about pastoral repair. Methane cannot repair poetry. I inhaled the data of air and exhale. After methane emissions were discovered at the model landfill, Swaco appealed to the courts to break its lease with Phoenix Golf Links, claiming the golfing company had insufficiently managed the landfill gas system. The golf course closed permanently in 2015 and Swaco shelved plans to reopen it at a later date. I'm here in 2019. This is not a praise poem. Language cannot do everything. This is gaseous modernity. When a gas attack violently startles Wilfred Owen in his famous World War I poem, Deutsche El Dokoromest, all the men in his company bar one swiftly don their masks. The slowest soldier don suffers an agonizing death, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, writes Owens, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. The green mustard gas gasps as failure suffocates the trench pastoral and his terrifying death asphyxiates the poet with nightmares. This toxicity sees arduously in the poem. It is gaseous, it is ugly vapor, a gas exchange in mammals. The gas tag is not an ode to the necropastoral, what Joel McSweeney describes as, quote, the manifestation of the infectiousness, anxiety, and contagion occultly present in the hygienic borders of the classic pastoral. But I'm attracted to this idea. I look for the idea of surfaces air at the model landfill. You tend not to address what you don't know. Owen's gaseous poetics, violate the shepherd's imaginary of fecund, meadows, and tender. This was part of the ode he painfully disclosed. The event was an anomaly until it happens again. Mm. On the driveway, I take photographs of trees and signs, tide bottles and language for near half a moment. One photograph partially develops, leaves a crooked line between appearances and fancies. A line is not a surface. The allure of the image is what it refuses to name. The slanting outside of the hasty frame, the ugly substance of stuff, the ghastly ears partial and present. That's the model story of the landfill. A golf course is not an archive. Print the light, surface, air. Pray the depth stink, sticks. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you for uh, your brilliance. Uh, my favorite lines, gaseous modernity. Uh, global surface is my skin. Methadone is greenhouse knowledge. Really brilliant. I loved it. Um, and hopefully we can find, you know, we'll get to see it somewhere. <laughs> um, all right. Let's uh, move on to Cecil. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Orchid, so much for news from my old, my old state from Ohio. And... Uh, Promises of hope. I speak, I speak to you from the Bay Area of California, from Berkeley, and uh, the, there's, there's so many issues. The, the, the most obvious one, I suppose, is the fires. And that's the issue of, uh, the issue of climate change, the elephant in the room, uh, which is going on now. Uh, it seems to have started before we imagined that it, that it would. Huge firestorms across the across the entire, the entire uh, uh, Northwest. Uh, but it also seems like everything is on fire. When, 
when the sky day before yesterday was, was, was still a dark purple at noon, it seemed to many of us that, uh, that the atmosphere itself was, uh, was, was commenting on the, on the times. It was a very, very freaky time. I'm at work within all of that on a book, a book called, a poetry book called Negro Mountain. Negro Mountain is a real mountain in Pennsylvania. It was named uh, for an 18th century incident in which a party of white explorers met a party of Lanape people on a mountainside. In the resulting skirmish, a black servant or slave took a bullet that was meant for his, meant for his owner or his boss, uh, whichever one it was. In any event, he died valiantly in the white explorer's service. And because of that, the mountain was named for his color uh, since the 18th century. I lived in rural Pennsylvania for 10 years. I'll read three poems from the book, all of which are about, about dreams from a sequence of series of dream poems uh, early in the book. Two of them, two of them mention wolves. Uh, and in a late section of the book, this is an early section of the book. In a late section of the book, I address the in real life return of wolves to Negro Mountain. Which seems to have occurred in uh, in 2000 2016. Wolves had been hunted to extinction in Pennsylvania by the end of the 19th century. So three dream poems from Negro Mountain. First dream. They're actually they're real dreams as well. First dream. Wolves came up the driveway and through the side yard of the old house. This was in kindergarten time. And I stood still, though I was frightened to be in their midst, and they took note of me, but did not bite me or threaten me. The light was light I had known by then, having seen it in the hour before a thunderstorm, dull, bitter light, and everywhere, though without apparent source. The wolves had ragged gray pelts, bad fur, tufts of it, and their hindquarters were skinny in comparison to their very big shoulders. They'd come in apparently from the street, Liscom Drive, and onto the property, which was nearly an acre, and had once been a farmstead. And they parted around where I was standing. It was almost literally a wave of them, those wolves, as though they'd come up the hill from West Third Street, or somehow got through the chain link fence of the VA cemetery that traced the hill on Liscom Drive. A white friend wrote me, the human figure passes through the animal pack unharmed, she said. And she said that she saw the dream as being not about the wolves as much as passing through adversity. This exchange decades after the dream itself, which had been a thing of moment, visual, tinctured with obvious anxiety, current in my memory for, the time, for that time before the year she and I met. Make no mistake, dear and articulate friends. I knew it was an unstable moment. My thumbs were different, I'd seen from one another. Beyond the driveway had been pear and walnut trees. One passes through a wood, or a track does. A dull feeling overtakes you in the field. There had been a gate at the driveway, but only the posts remained, grown over by the hedges that stopped on either side of the entrance from the street. What do hills summarize? Origin stories? Right and left separated long before this, bait me, love. I can pass until I speak. Fifth dream from Negro Mountain. Returning from where? In a hospital ship, approaching New York Harbor after months at sea, confined below deck, but free to watch the crew, kitchen boys and the nurses as well out on the bow with their cell phones through my portal. We were coming in slow under zebra skies and glided right past the colossal Statue of Liberty and the reek of diesel was everywhere, a smoky dawn indeed. But in the dream, my situation was ambiguous. At once I was ill with a complicated fever and also simply returning to the hospital up the Hudson River where I had worked long before, where I'd use my old knowledge of the wards to move around inside. I could pass unnoticed, I understood, this ability or necessity being the frame of some lesson or subplot in which I was a double agent. In fact, I was a monster in the dream. 
apparently narcissistic, though ill-featured and grisly, and talented, meaning predatory. Cherish your grudges, I thought, dreaming. Watch monsters. Waking, which is to say now, I think I'd probably been dead and was returning from that, it having been impermanent, death having been some location on a trade route, which in the dreams economy that could be reached by conventional water traffic. But in the dream, it was just a shallow business. That is, I'd come back willingly, but not jubilantly. Sums based in memory, the observed <laughs> moment on the bow, for example, though I was always to be the visitor. And two, I had helped set a trap for the monster I was. This split also a tiresome trope and predictable. Predictable as well was that the trap, a wooden shark cage was obviously insubstantial. But as the visitor, I approached the cage eagerly because it was to have been baited with another of my kind. And I anticipated happily ripping it apart and freeing my comrade. But upon arrival at the cage via a series of corridors that brought me to an interior room in the hospital, I found it empty. By then though, I was simply a white man. I was by then beyond disappointment, but was recognized immediately and detained in the room, confined once more until a nurse came and I overpowered her and bade her keep quiet while I escaped. Leaving the hospital, I stepped into the street and began to run knowing I'd be caught, the town being too small for me to melt in. River mouth town, low tide, just stinking up the estuary as I leapt from bridge to bridge and began to compose a story that would free me, one that made reference to my doppelganger, the black criminal or servant, the faithful one, also of colossal proportions, but even so dead of his wounds in the jungle. Or perhaps it was only that he was a comedian memorialized in the papers, having been carried off by fever like a pioneer, and how my white freedom would add value to his memory. Who was my host in this foolishness between sea and land? What horse was I riding? What crocodiles was this in the service of? Feeling the story's a sham, not liking that as I stacked it together. Last one, seventh dream from Negro Mountain. <laughs> Carson's family was beautiful in the dream, bright and rambunctious, a sexual disaster for the jungle. But wolves came back. The dreams recur like days of a hot week. There's a time of afternoon when the buses are frequent, but this slacks off in the racial cities by early evening and I was dreaming of riding number one through town. And and I was dreaming of riding number one through town and jungle both, lucky to have flagged it down at dusk and finding the familiar colored suburb to be everywhere and bigger by half than memory, finding in fact that everywhere in camp was now black in fact and outlook. I saw a cloud of rage over the treetops. Several types of argument were apparently at play. Mm. Made by whom? Who was there? in whose name. It was dusk, and as I rode, I saw how Camp Town is just a long sleeve for how the place was ranging. Once covered with white neighborhoods, it was now a simple mountain, the neighborhoods themselves abandoned, the white people having bamoosed. And now in the dream, crisscrossed with animal paths, the white people's houses <laughs> gone to ruin as well, and wolf dens, evidence of the return noted above all over, up and down the ridges, the space that occupied. The dream was typical, a canopy itself for Temper's unrehearsed volume. Waking now, the question would be, what business do the wolves have on jungle byways? What do they conform to or offer? It's how number one's in conversation more so with the hillside, its familiar route being the creep over the ridges. Number one being commonality itself described as the moving point, the move practically a walk in terms of pace. Overtake me, love. That's it, thank you. Ah, thank you. Thank you for a, a fine reading. Uh, my favorite lines, what do hills summarize? 
I come back willingly, but not jubilantly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a fine reading. Up next, uh, we have Petra. Uh, you're muted, Petra. I know I'm no longer muted. So here we okay. go. My voice is out. Okay. Thank you. I'm delighted to be reading with you all. I'm just so glad that you all agreed to be part of this. And I just had to get up a second ago and just the book closest to me on the shelves was this one. Yes, Cecil. So this is um, Geopoetics in Practice. And in there is a wonderful story of the wolf and your story, um, your material. And I'm, I'm actually teaching that one in just two weeks time. So I'm very excited. So the poem and this clearly seems so related. So thank you. I'm just so glad I got, I got to listen to, um, to your reading tonight. Your Thanks. students won't forgive you. Oh, no, I think they love it. I think it's going to be great. Okay, people. So I'm going to read from Gut Botany. And so this is not a wolf. This is a beautiful sturgeon, right? So this is a, these are the, the fish, the ancient, old, creepy fish that are happily swimming around in the big lakes around here, including maybe here in Crystal Lake that you can see right behind me, there's a reflection of, of where I am up here in, in up North Michigan. So the sturgeon is my animal for, for this book, a book of healing, a book of practices of hope. And I'm gonna read you the first one in the book, Gut Botany. Um, uh, the, the poem is called Gut Body. And it's a participatory book. I am a performance person, so I usually do involve my audiences in some way, and I've been learning how to try to do that in Zoom spaces. So I will invite you to bow with me, and you will find out where that is in the poem. I'd like you to hold your heart, your stomach, and your sexual organs, whatever that means to you. Okay, so that's what I'll invite you to do as we're moving through here. And I'd like you to think about what this means to you, because all different kinds of cultures have meaning, holds, hold some kind of sacred space for those three areas. It's like a very common, um, common areas of the body to have specific meanings. So I like you to bring those meanings to this poem, whereas I'm sharing my own journey, which involves healing from sexual assault. Sucker punch, the knife in the street, fear of being sheared out of the stream into the backwater, dead fish belly up by the side of the pond, pills and poisons and endings let go and sever the ties and ignore the party is always elsewhere. A shadow in a canoe in a photo likely put on Facebook tomorrow, fake of having fun behind the grass tree, a Stephen King book where I know the next sentence already, primacy of white masculine fear, close the leaky gut, body drained of tears. Just speak, walk with me, close the loop. Bow forward, pour yourself into your capable hands and hold your heart. Release. Bow forward, pour your stomach into your feeble hands. Release the binds that bind so tightly to your spinal column. Release. Bow again, drop your sexual organs into waiting hands. Wait. Breathe in, out in, soothe, release. Fish slip into the labyrinth of intestines, cruise past the atlas, feet on the carpet fibers of worry. Agile between the lung pearls, hollow behind the liver, green wall, delicate black veins spider along for companionship, dark purple, maroon. Fins soothe the red spots of tension, white bands where muscles have leached nourishment out of tight bands. Between kidney and uterus, raspy tongue licks soggy dahlias on their stalks, ovaries bloom, glide mucus oils the way, swim among the velvet, you and me, 
into plump cushions, sturgeon tumbling ground. So that was the first poem. And just feel into those areas. Feel what it means for you to heal. Think about which images, which metaphor complexes, which elements of your world around you give you peace and healing. So that's to me the core of the work that I'm engaged in right now. I'm now reading you another poem called Wind Tongue. It's also from the, from the same book, Sturgeon book. And it's specifically about trees. And you can just see, I knew it was like seven o'clock at night. It was sort of just about the moment where you might not be able to see anymore outside here, but you can still see the hemlock tree, right? When I'm moving, see the hemlock tree there? Mm -hmm. All right, so right now in, the, in recent months since COVID started and since we've been up here, um, I've developed a relationship with this hemlock tree. And the tree that, I'm, that this poem is about is a different one. It's in a botanical garden in uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. But um, yeah, what I'm reading about is very similar to the work that I'm doing right now with Hemlock and that Hemlock allows me to do and offers me space for. So thank you, Hemlock. Wind tongue. I go blue. I drop out, I go, and I skirt school and work, and I run away and I go. Forest I, won't I, won't I, shall not, and I leave now, and here I am, red cardinal pecks in the dirt far behind, water rushes past sleeping snakes, babe dragons with rattles that shake in the wind when they dry, summer dreams deep beneath ice-cold water, vernal peepers, north face hikers, Canadian geese step into sweetly mown grass path, verging along the river, drops into black mud, stiff on my cowboy boots, I tumble, tree, wind, shake, elasticity of the young snakeskin bark. Tissue high and erect as I stroke into a fit between the softness of my palm and crocodile that rears along the way, bits branch out and skewer. I poke, I pierce, stumble and relax. When I give my weight, when I give in, when I bow into you and pass spears, you echo, sway, far off cars meander through net, muscles flexed, cambium shaken, windstorm, memory, a scream near the nature center, Kids spur tremble earth and bridge and mud on the path where I try to, try to, try to again, to try to reach to my childhood play, to lean, to be all natural, open, to be open, to be, to be, to live, to breathe and to be and to cycle through land and forest is open, is open, is alive, is try, is bridge, is memory spur, is a spear in an eye and a socket and a yell and a muscle and a bow, a bow, a weight, a tremble, a sleep and a dark dark wind and a bridge and a dark and now it's too much and it hurts and I feel all the pinch all pressure all the all the all the all the leave it and let it and drop this and why so I sit down and write palm tingling with a bark's rough tongue hey all right, I think I have, yeah, I have one more uh, with my time. So I'm going to read you now um, a piece from Moon Botany. See how here the sturgeons are in the interleaves, which are the, the colors of the inside of the body. We have the sturgeon upside down, which I love. The designers did such a fabulous job. I adore it. So this is um, from Moon Botany. I was with my dear friend Sharon Siskin, who's a visual artist in an artist residency. And... I am a, I'm a wheelchair user, so I can't go on nature hikes and on long nature hikes. I can get to on really small ones, just like in the car park, touch the tree. I can do that. Um, but she went off on huge nature hikes and then brought me these lovely elements from out there, you know, materials. And so I then rode with these elements on these vaguely um, complicated, sarcastic nature walks. And um, I, these are persona poems. They are engaged with 
the creatures, the elements, the materials that I find my, on, my, on my table in the morning outside my residency home. Found on an Oregonian playa. Oh, so that's not the one I was gonna read. And since I handed out access copies, I should stick with the one I was gonna read, sorry. Found on the pond deck. The husk of a tiny dragonfly, translucent, clings upside down on a yellow sphere of grass. Its roots, its roots clasp the dry wood of the deck. Tiny white fibers everywhere. The planks breathing, expectorate their innards. Wood weeps and uncoils what it knew when it stood, tall in a wet redwood forest, before the chains of a truck bed, dark and long, bite here, where all trees are twisted into themselves against the prevailing winds. On that white spun deck, I remember my watery nature, pour my liquid body to wash away the pain of the shorter years, to wash away the pain of a hollow embrace, the feeling that we all will slide, not into the clear pool, but into the murk of a place that should not be settled. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Really lovely reading. That is a gorgeous book. If you don't have it, get it. It is so beautifully produced. Um, I, you know, really nicely done. Thank you. Um, my favorite lines. Um, let's see. Uh, the party is always elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move on and go to Ashley. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ashley Lucas, and I want to start by thanking Petra and DJ for inviting me to be a part of this beautiful issue of Practices of Hope. Um, I am so honored, and it seems prescient that you all would have been thinking about hope before the pandemic began, because we sure do need it in abundance right now. I wanna specifically lift up in hope all of our brothers and sisters who are in prisons throughout the world. What I'm gonna to read to you tonight is an excerpt from uh, my book, which just came out, which is called Prison Theater and the Global Crisis of Incarceration. And uh, I got to travel to 10 different countries to see as much theater in prisons as I could back when people could actually travel. And I met some extraordinary folks inside prisons. What I wanna to read to you tonight um, is about some women in a prison in Brazil who were a huge inspiration to me and who had a lot of hope. Uh, and I dedicate this reading as Petra dedicated hers to the graduate students from the Graduate Employees Organization who are on strike at the University of Michigan right now and to the RAs, dining hall workers, construction workers, building and trade workers, and faculty and staff who have joined them in saying to the university that we really need to be safe in this pandemic and what we don't need is more police on our campus. So this is an excerpt from Prison Theater and the Global Crisis of Incarceration. A group of women I met in a prison in Brazil used the theater to insist that they would survive in spite of all they had suffered. On July 9th, 2013, my colleague Andy Martinez, several of my University of Michigan students and I made our first trip to a Brazilian prison with Professor Natalia Fischi and her students from the Universidade Federal do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, also known as UniRio. It's the federal university in Rio de Janeiro. Natalia and the Teatro na Prisão program have been doing theater work in prison since 1997, and I had come to Brazil to begin building an exchange program in which Natalia and I would bring our students to each other's countries and prisons to share best practices. The room in which Teatro na Prisão was meeting at Penitenciaria Talavera Brusi, a women's prison, is concrete on all surfaces, like the rest of the building, and has a small raised stage at one end. The dozen or so incarcerated women in the group welcomed the Unijio students, Natalia, and even us visitors with smiles and hugs. Those of us who had done work in US prisons were surprised to see that even with a guard in the room, male volunteers and incarcerated women were allowed to hug without repercussions. Teatro na Prisao uses both improvisatory games based on theater of the oppressed and traditional theatrical scripts as starting points for its work. 
At the time of our visit, they were in rehearsals for an original devised performance based on Romeo and Juliet. The Unihio students and incarcerated women set up chairs to make an audience of all of us visitors, and they put a small partition upstage right. This served as an area of her costume changes and also became Juliet's balcony when she would poke her head over the top of the partition to, to talk to Romeo. The women had a great time with the costumes, which were diverse and rather impressive. They were well worth the women's enthusiasm. They even had swords made out of paper mache for the fight scenes. While the women were trying on costumes before the play got started, we had some time to talk to the workshop participants before they began their rehearsal. One woman told me about her five children, two of whom had died. Of the remaining three, two lived with her mother. In my limited Portuguese, I did not understand what she was telling me about the whereabouts of the third child, but it seemed important to this woman that we know that she had a life and a family beyond the walls of the prison. She had people who loved her and hopes for a future reunited with them. This workshop was using the story of Romeo and Juliet, but not Shakespeare's text, even in Portuguese translation. The Unihio facilitators had given the women a basic outline of the scenes and the women improvised using Shakespeare's character and plot, or at least as much of it as they liked. This particular adaptation of Romeo and Juliet began on the streets of Verona where the Montagues and Capulets were sizing each other up for a fight. The opening scene was very funny because one actor in particular, I believe she was a Capulet, was doing such a good job of goading her opponents with gestures and facial expressions. As in Shakespeare's original Prince Aeschylus, a government official from Verona, appeared and stopped the fight with a speech about keeping the peace. The rival families dispersed with another round of intimidating looks and hand motions. Then the whole cast attended a masquerade ball at the Capulet residence. Everyone appeared in sequined Mardi Gras masks and danced to funky carioca. Uh, it, it's a kind of Brazilian hip hop that comes out of the favelas, as though they were at a modern day nightclub. The cast was obviously having a great time and seemed surprised and excited by this choice of music. The Unihio students had brought a small boombox and played a number of selections of background music at different points in the play. Apparently, in prior rehearsals, they had played more classical dance music, and the women in the workshop found it boring and refused to do much dancing. With funky carioca as their inspiration, the dance party became a whole lot of fun for the audience and cast alike. Romeo and Juliet fell in love at the dance. And when Romeo left the party, he was so overjoyed that his happiness was positively contagious. He ran to his friends to sing Juliet's praises and then collapsed in a lovelorn heap downstage center to contemplate the many virtues of his love. Juliet's head popped up over the partition in the back of the stage and she began a soliloquy about Romeo's virtues. He quickly leapt to his feet and ran to stand beneath her balcony. They had an enthusiastic exchange and ran off shortly thereafter to be wed by the friar. The two women playing Romeo and Juliet were allowed to share what appeared to be a pretty decent kiss, albeit with Juliet's wedding veil in between them, a level of physical contact that I would not expect to be allowed in prison theater in the United States. At this point in the story, we encountered a most excellent bit of comedy along with a casting change. In order to give more women the opportunity to have significant roles, a new actor took over for Juliet just after the marriage scene. An Unihio student named Paolo Gimelo had been telling me about the double casting before we arrived at the prison. He referred to the first actor as the long-haired Juliet and the second actor as the short-haired Juliet. The long-haired Juliet played the character as demure and a bit shy, while the short-haired Juliet was far more outgoing and demonstrative in her love of Romeo. The first time we saw the short-haired Juliet, she was helping Romeo to sneak into her bedroom so that they could consummate their wedding night. She darted out from behind the upstage right partition, grabbed Romeo by the arm, and drug him into the bedroom. A number of actors were hidden behind the partition and they enacted Romeo and Juliet's lovemaking by throwing articles of clothing into the air along with whoops and shouts. We in the audience loved it. Romeo emerged from the wedding night all aglow with his love for Juliet and stumbled into the street fight that killed both Tybalt, who is Juliet's cousin, and Mercutio, who is Romeo's friend. Then Juliet, distraught by this news, took a sleeping potion to fake her death. Romeo found her, believed her to be dead, and then, in the first major break from the Shakespearean plot, 
proceeded to get falling down drunk. The women unanimously disliked Shakespeare's ending to the tragedy, so they decided to change it. Romeo passed out and Juliet wakes up from her sleep, first worried that Romeo was dead and then became very irritated at Romeo for having gotten drunk. She shook him awake and forced him to his feet where he stumbled around still drunk and trying to explain himself, yet overjoyed by Juliet's unexpected recovery. The family's reconciled, another funky carioca dance party ensued, curtain call. The Unihio facilitators later explained to me that they had been introducing the play to the women in sequential order, starting at the beginning. And when they reached the point where the lovers commit suicide, the women revolted. They had no attachment to the sanctity of Shakespeare and thought he had been wrong to kill off Romeo and Juliet in the bloom of their love and youth. These women live in a prison every day and they insisted on, they needed a happy ending. How could they, after months of rehearsal and investment in these characters, let them become little more than collateral damage in a turf war that might never end? The actors would play people who lived survivors of the unceasing violence that surrounded them all of their lives and divided neighbors from one another. Most prisons in the world have seen their more than their share of suicides. And this company of women, uh, this company of incarcerated actors had no desire to act out something they knew all too well and had likely witnessed firsthand. The Teatro Naprizao adaptation of Romeo and Juliet became a roadmap to hope for women who wake up in prison every morning and decide once more not to kill themselves. After the applause died down, the women and the Unihio facilitators cleared away our chairs and formed a circle. Not only did they include all of us in their circle, they deliberately spaced themselves between us so that each visitor held hands on both sides with an incarcerated woman. The music began again and one of the Unihio students jumped into the circle and started dancing. We all cheered. He pulled one of the incarcerated women into the middle with him and then exited to rejoin the circle so that the woman could have the spotlight to herself. We danced in this way for quite a while, each person in the middle bringing in a new person before rejoining the group. Then we held hands again. And Natalia talked to the women about how important their weekly attendance at the workshop is. She made sure that each of them understood that the community they had formed relied on their presence to continue. Then we broke the circle. Out of what felt like nowhere, a table appeared with food and drinks that the Unihio students had brought with them to the prison, and we were all encouraged to eat and drink as we mingled and talked about the performance. When the refreshments were gone, we all hugged and thanked one another before we left, the women heading off into a different area of the prison as we made our way back out the front gate. In the years since I watched Romeo and Juliet live to see another day, their joy and hopefulness have stayed with me. Unexpected happy endings in prison shine like beacons of resistance. When one cannot secure one's own freedom from incarceration or an oppressive government, then perhaps imagining a world in which Romeo and Juliet can overcome their previously inevitable tragedies gives performers and audiences alike a sense of hope. Perhaps the kind of devastation that we predict for women, the poor, the uneducated, the oppressed, and the imprisoned are neither logical nor inescapable. If in this one instance, incarcerated women have more authority than Shakespeare to decide the ending of a play, what else might be possible? The women imprisoned at Talavera Brusi refused to die, and instead they danced to funky carioca towards the futures they would like to have. Thank you. Ah, thank you for such a lovely reading. Um, all right, my favorite lines, allow uh, hugs with repercussions with or without repercussions, I think is what you said. She had people who loved her and hoped for a future with. <clears throat> they insisted on and needed a happy ending. Ah, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, who's up next? DJ, um, with no fanfare. Okay, thank and, you. And a brand new book though. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, brand new book that only 
only took me 15 years to write, just not very long at all. Sad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my book um, explores the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness of Idaho, Montana, which um, along with the Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness and the Gospel Hump is the largest um, <clears throat> segment of wordless land in the U.S. outside of Alaska. Uh, I especially, uh, and my family has been connected to this area for a hundred years, although I only found out that, that, that they were about 15 years ago. So um, mm -hmm. that was kind of my first foray into the wilderness. And I went in many, many times through the years with family, friends. One of the people I went in with several times is, is on our panel, Cecil. Um, and I, I want to um, call attention to the cover because this uh, is a canyon. It's Blodgett Canyon um, on the front cover. And Cecil and a, another friend of ours uh, and I've spent a, a rainy, snowy week in Blanchett Canyon, snowshoeing up the canyon and reading, you know, by candlelight in the rain. And, and um, Cecil's been back there um, other times. So gave me a lot of insight into some of the, you know, the conflicted history of the place. Um, anyway, I, uh, I not only looked at my family history, um, I looked at the larger history of, of, the, of this particular piece of land and, and what, um, you know, the idea of wild and wilderness means to an American identity. Um, there's also a lot of, um, you know, people go missing and there's bear attacks and stuff like that. So I, so it has everything. So anyway, I'm going to read from a chapter um, in the middle of the book, um, just a short uh, portion of it. And actually I'm going to screen share. Um, let's see. Uh, and I'm going to show you guys a little um, video while I read. And the video kind of gives you a sense of the landscape, not in the wilderness, but just outside the wilderness. So almost a decade after my grandmother died, I made a four hour drive to Traveler's Rest State Park in Lolo, Montana. Whoops, sorry. <clears throat> On the edge of the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, the park is hidden in the landscape. A long gravel driveway surrounded by brome grass fields leads to the interpretive center, bookstore, and park offices. It was late autumn, and the cottonwood, aspen, and birch burned in gemstone tones. When I got out of the car, I heard Lolo Creek rattling in the distance. Inside, I was greeted by Vernon, a man in a black leather jacket with a long gray ponytail, who ran the place. He mentioned he was a Blackfeet Indian and she showed me around the display cases containing samples of the Lewis and Clark expedition journals and tools the group had used. Since I was the only visitor, we went into Vernon's office, a metal desk, messy bookshelf, and one high window to talk. Traveler's Rest is the most important campsite of the Lewis and Clark expedition, which took place from 1804 to 1806. Although the expedition is a tired and contentious story in US history, I became fascinated with it when I learned that the Bitterroots nearly did them in. Some of their horses fell down ravines, they found little food, and at one point they had to tie rags around their naked wounded feet to go on. The expedition officers were not given to complaint except when crossing these mountains. They called the bitter roots a stony bad land, a horrible mountainous desert. The expedition would not have survived without Nimipu guides. Lewis wrote in uh, 1806, we were entirely surrounded by those mountains from which to one unacquainted with them, it would have seemed impossible ever to have escaped. In short, without the insistence of our guides, I doubt whether we who had once passed them could find our way to Traveler's Rest. The first question I asked Vernon was about the expedition's efforts on the Nimipu. Jefferson ordered the expedition to gather information about the tribes they met as they traveled, not just the Nimipu, but the Lakota, Cheyenne, Crow, 
Blackfeet, Shoshone, Spokane, Yakima, and others, and Lewis especially, followed these orders, keeping meticulous account complete with drawings. Vernon leaned back in his chair and spoke in a calm, steady voice about how Lewis came west, believing that America was destined to run from coast to coast. What was really disturbing about Lewis was that he attempted to categorize the indigenous people he met without fully understanding how intricate native social and political structures were. If you read Lewis's journals all the way through, Vernon said, you can see him following the linear European model of classifying people in order to control them. Lewis really began the thought process of not appreciating the complexity of native people that went right through to the establishment of the res reservations, Vernon continued, as he raised his expressive gray eyebrows and looked over his glasses, not smiling, but not scowling either. That's one of the most significant things about his life and death. He was the beginning of the opening of the West. Lewis made the template for how this country was going to deal with native peoples. And it's always struck me how little he understood. Whenever you try to establish some kind of order, but you don't really have the skill or the understanding, you're going to mess it up. Looking back, I'm fairly certain Vernon was not implying that I was messing things up with my questions, but I sometimes wonder if that was exactly what I was doing. A few months after my meeting with him at Traveler's Rest, I would fly across the country to Cherokee County on a naive quest to establish some kind of order to my family tree. Cherokee County is shouldered into the border of Oklahoma and Missouri on the extreme southwest corner of Kansas. Columbus, a town of 3,000, is the county seat and my grandfather's hometown. Of the middle, many unsettling aspects of the Lewis and Clark expedition, I was most bothered by their repeated references to their friendly relations with Native women. I learned that they even carried mercury pills to prevent venereal disease. They never let on if they fathered children, but they probably did. And certainly some of the Nimipu tribal members claim that the story of Sitsuke or the anglicized version daytime smoke, son of a supposed union between Clark and a Nimipu woman. Daytime Smoke's photos are splashed across the internet. He's a small man with long, dark hair. His story emerges in histories like Alan Pinkham and Stephen Evans' book, Lewis and Clark Among the Nez Perce, and in a display case in the Nez Perce National Historic Park near Lewiston, Idaho. Easily findable online is a man claiming to be a Colville with the surname Clark, who surmises he and his siblings descended from the famous explorer. As with my ancestral history, the more troubled I was by the story of daytime smoke, the less able I was to verify its truth. Sometimes I believe daytime smoke's mixed identity was mostly accurate, sometimes highly unlikely sometimes pure fiction. It wasn't until I understood that what mattered less than the truth of the story was the fact that it was told at all, as if the expeditions tracked through the Bitterroots and their rescue by the Nimipu needed a flesh and blood offspring that I could fully embrace it. Embracing the story meant accepting the paradox of daytime spoke, smoke and to a lesser extent of my grandfather. Because whoever daytime smoke was, it seems certain that he fled in 1877 with Chief Joseph and the other non-treaty Nimipu over the Bitterroots while they were being chased by the US Army. It was not at all extraordinary for daytime smoke to join with the only family he'd ever known, but his journey was a stinging irony. Daytime smoke made from Lewis and Clark's opening of the West was also made to fight against the terror of that opening. The further irony for me was that daytime smoke like Joseph and the other fleeing Nimipu 
was deported to Quapaw, Oklahoma, a few miles from Cherokee County and my grandfather's hometown. After Vernon and I talked for several hours, he asked if I wanted to walk the 55 acre property, which was, he said, the only site along the entire Lewis and Clark Trail where the Park Service had forked over money for aerial infrared photography and first rate archeologists. They'd found artifacts, a button, a piece of metal, and the remains of latrines, proving the expedition had camped there. In their investigations, Vernon explained as we strolled the park, they also found Native American fire pits, flint tools, and arrow arrowheads, establishing Travelers West Rest as a significant campsite for all kinds of tribes and bands who had moved through the area from time immemorial, a meeting place of cultures, histories. A bridge led across Lolo Creek, and we stopped there, leaning on the railing and listening to the water fall over the boulders. It had rained earlier that morning and a lovely fresh scent permeated the air. You done? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the, the, the long glance <laughs> into uh, the history. Um, all right, my favorite lines, the bitter root nearly did them in. Uh, <laughs> uh, stony badland and not scowling, but not smiling either. All right. Hey, you know. Hey, Jackson, right. I love your or your best lines. That's that's such a good uh, that's such a good talent you have. Oh no, I gotta listen. Uh <laughs> now, now we get to hear from you. I'm so excited. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share a few poems and one quilt, one art quilt. Um, I don't. Um, I don't think I'm going to explain who this person is because, uh, uh, or this figure is, because I think the poem does, should do the work, I hope. Um, Old to Iyansa. Iyansa, the austere gates of divine mystery, which you so aptly guard, are now flung open, accepting so many from the hospitals, nursing homes, streets, and transit. The lines between the city of the living and the city of the dead are now blurred open for quick crossings without rituals or ceremonies of leave taking and the long goodbyes. Once you were content to keep to be the keeper of secrets wearing a rose colored head wrap quietly attending to the new returnees. Your legion of invisible ones always willing to aid the living. Iyansa, the city where I live has so many dead that you have taken up residence in parking lots with truckloads of former husbands, wives, grandmothers, grandfathers, sons, and daughters. You are 191,000 lives stronger than you ever intended to be. Iyansa, your tears have flowed unceasing for all the many gone. You fight to keep as many as you can alive. Iyansa, you are the goddess whose gifts can both save humans and give others a quick, merciful end. Your ancient rivers flow up and, dial, up and down the Nile tributary, where only a hint of your power is mirrored. Bless the day you can close your gates. Um, this is This America. Soft leaves of a real spring, bursting free on every branch. So glad to be part of creation. Seven artists sitting in a half shell, each a lit flame. We don't have all the answers our people crave, but together we can create something we can survive with. Savor the sister in white, smudging sage over policemen in riot gear. What mojo do we need for this new time where protesters are framed as terrorists? And this week we are asked to believe a lone black man broke his own spine in three places. How do we arm and protect ourselves in this America? 
next poem is for a young woman. Um, it's called Soul Memory, and it's for a young woman named Renisha McBride. Forgive the grandmother who found you barely conscious, mumbling, stupid, drunk, walking circles around your car, who thought you, who thought she could leave you and go back into her house. Forgive the loss of mother wit, the inability to grab you and bring you, daughter, you baby girl, on into the house. Forgive her lost in the disconnect of centuries to not call for an ambulance to get you help. Forgive her return to the street to find you gone out of sight. Too old to follow you to get someone, anyone to go look for you. Forgive yourself for going out that night of all nights to party and drink, to hang out like any normal 19-year-old, to know, to believe you were in control. Forgive the lost ones of you. Forgive the night so dark your brown-skinned self could not be found. Forgive your Ori so blindly drunk and in shock from a car crash. Forgive the incoherent selves wandering only knowing to seek help crying for help. Forgive this moment, day, that you went into an all-white woods and neighborhood. Forgive yourself so lost, motherhood and fatherhood gone, so lost, so shocked, so drunk you rang that man's door, and all your last moments lost in the horror of shots to your head, heart, and soul. Forgive the night you wanted to party so, wanted to live so. Forgive all the wrong turns, the last four drinks you had. Forgive yourself for thinking somehow you were in control, had done this how many times before. Forgive the cursed moment of speed, of all the wrong turns of walking and walking uh, and walking on the longest walk that would never end until you were nothing but soul. Lost black woman, lost black girl on a white man's porch in a place so bad he never gave you a chance. Came out shooting at your blackness, black woman blackness seeking help. Forgive this time, the moment that never gave you a chance. Forgive all the wrong turns, the speed, the drinks, the desire to party. Forgive this time that never gave you a chance. And I have one other poem, um, The Malika Dance in My Shoes. And the Malika is a, a Swahili word for an angel or African angels. And this poem um, is published in uh, the latest issue of Cutthroat. Language came to the door, wearing fuchsia shoes and three sandy red braids. Language sashayed to the door and opened another door and another door and another as endless kink in my hair unraveled. Language banged on the door, burying her buck teeth, cursing the hell out of me, shoeless, wearing a chartreuse lace boo-boo, spraying me with wisdom's juju jive. And I was alone but not lonely, turning the great nothing they gave me into a world, a real world. Discovering the simplest loves can be a whole life. Transcendent change makers, code switchers, make fools out of themselves, hungry for love's discernment. Who gave away all the wine? Is that local water on the table? I try not to eat the bitter seeds from the bitter past. Language jumped inside my shoes like the Malika, whispering, find anything new, even something half used to begin again. To begin again, Lord, what does it mean to begin again? As I wander into a new self, become a different woman, do not erase me with anger. Do not erase me with blindness. Do not erase me with judgment, hive of a thousand bee wings buzzing a lifetime of regrets. Do not erase me with those who know nothing of love, of equanimity or grace. Do not erase me with the acts of the cowardly. Do not erase me with those who fear their mother's truth. Do not erase my light. Do not erase me. Do not erase me. All right, and I'm gonna share one quilt. Um, thank you. Um, let's see if I can do the share screen thing. Uh, 
And just because I prepared this, um, let's see if I can find the, and of course I can't find the image I wanna share, okay. Uh, DJ, can you help me? <laughs> you just need to have the image open on your computer. So I have the I image can... open first. Um, well, yes. here, here. there it is. You're good. Okay, thank you. Um, so much, so much for preparation. Um, this is called Maya Angelou in her garden. Um, it's a quilt. It's a very small quilt. It's 35 by 27 inches. Um, and it's an applic it's a, a machine applique. Uh, the background fabric was a gift from the fabric workshop in Philadelphia. Um, it's a silk screen piece of fabric. Um, and, um, I, it's based, it's, it's based on a photo, um, that was taken of Maya, uh, in her garden. Um, by a very highfalutin Hollywood photographer who I had to pay. I basically paid him a pittance of what he normally would have gotten. Um, and he humored me and took the money. Um, I'll say uh, this is a statement on the back of the quilt. I love Maya Angelou, her writing and her example as a human being. She was a large woman who lived a large life. Um, this shows her in a rare moment of quiet in her garden. Um, and I later also came to find out that this, this was also a time in her life when she was very much in love and um, had agreed to marry a man, a white man, um, who James Baldwin had convinced her to go for it. Um, but it was, it was uh, in a time in her life, this was not her public life, this was her private life. Um, and so I just wanna share that with you. Um, and that, that's it. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm a two-headed, three-headed child, so I'm always working in more than one art form. So <laughs> that's all I could say. That's delightful. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for sharing. You. And I'm so glad to see the quilt again because you so kindly gave that quilt to a disability arts and culture exhibit that we had in Ypsilanti. And I just was so happy to have that work in there and to have this, the evidence of, of the labor and the layering. I think it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not the best line, but the, but the best long riff was that long series of, uh, series of forgivenesses. You know, oh, the, thank you. In that in that long piece for the for the for Miss McBride, and how and how forgiveness change mutates, you know, uh, and becomes encyclopedic and kind of brilliant all the way all the way through. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you, thank yeah. you. I should also say, Jacqueline, that I will copy the comments uh, for everybody and send them. And you got so many best lines in the comments. I can't even read them all, but you will see. <laughs> <laughs> that, that forgiveness um, riff was definitely a favorite. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Well, you know, my, my view on forgiveness is uh, it's a 192 step program <laughs> for, for most humans. <laughs> yeah. It takes us forever. <laughs> um, okay. well, yeah, and we are, um, uh, I'm asking the audience that we've had, a, we have about 26 viewers, but we did have about 32. Um, if they have any questions to go ahead and definitely put them or comments that you wanna share with the authors and put them in the um, chat here. Um, and I just also wondered if our, I'm gonna put turn us to um, Kyle view, if, if you guys had questions for one another while we're waiting for the audience to um, ask some questions. I could ask what, what are people working on next? What's coming next? That's a great question. Great question. Who wants to take it first? I well, can say some. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Ashley, go ahead. I um, I'm working on an article right now that I'm co-authoring with a former graduate student of mine named Alexandra Friedman and with a currently incarcerated uh, 
journalist and intellectual named Efren Paredes. Efren is currently at Lakeland Correctional in the southern part of Michigan, and he has been doing some incredible reporting from inside the walls about what's happening during the pandemic in his particular prison. And we got really inspired by him, um, Ali and I did, and I was invited to contribute a chapter to an edited volume about citizenship. And so we decided to write about the ways in which currently and formerly incarcerated people exercise their rights towards citizenship through activism on both sides of the wall. So that, that's what we're working on writing right now. Mm. Nice. Anyone else? You want to expand on your uh, Negro Mountain work, Cecil? Unmute, unmute. Expand on it. Uh, it's a it's a book that I've been working on for a long time, and it needs to be over. <laughs> that's <laughs> that I need to I need to I need to finish you know to finish it. It's a it's a survey of a, a survey of, of of history, human history, natural history, uh, including obviously racial you know racial history, psychic history, uh, merged onto a, onto a certain a certain place a place that I lived for I lived for ten for 10 years. But it's the thing that I've been thinking about as you know, as, pe as people have talked, um, maybe in particular, the, uh, the, the gesture at Maya, Maya Angelou was the first, the po first poetry reading I went to actually was by Maya Angelou. That would have been, I think probably in about 1970 or 1971 <laughs> before she was Maya Angelou. And, um, and I've written a great deal about, um, about my West Indian family especially about my West Indian family in Canada, where, where we've been going for, for the last two centuries, escaping, stopping in the States and saying, nah, and going on. Uh, but that was one part of the family. The other part, uh, which is becoming more and more, you know, as I'm engaged in uh, closing up my grandparents' house in St. Louis. I got to go back to St. Louis in two weeks to do that. Mm. And there's... And uh, they came from, my mother's people came from Mississippi. And the weird thing is what they brought with them is the, uh, when they left they, in an automobile, they had some money, they'd been to college. Um, 1917, 1918, they drove out of Mississippi into uh, to Illinois and then St. St. Louis and somehow brought with them my grandmother's bureau uh, they weren't, as my grandfather told me many times, yeah, we didn't do too bad for poor folks. <laughs> they brought the bureau with them, huge thing. And it was a gift to my grandmother's grandmother from her owner. And so this is the slave, the slave bureau. Right. And, uh, and I guess in consultation with my daughter, I've agreed to, as we close up the house in two weeks, to somehow get that bureau back to, you know, back to Berkeley. Mm. Mm. And so, and there's, I don't know, their names are, the, the family names are on that side of the family are S Smith and Brown and Jackson. So it's kind of hard to research because there's mm. hundreds of them. Okay. Um, but I got to go to Mississippi at some, at some point and see that I suspect now I know, I know in fact there were deals that, that were deals with the devil that were made and mm -hmm. uh, that are rumored and full of contradictions and uh, so in company with my cousins uh, we're, we're starting to plan what we might what we might do mm -hmm. around that mm -hmm. so that's the you know, that's 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 coming that's coming. Cool. We have a couple questions. Uh, Cecil, this is a quick one for you. And then we have a, a one for Jacqueline. Uh, Cecil, did you ever ride up Negro Mountain on your bike? <laughs> I have not ridden up Negro Mountain on my bike, but there's a bike path that I'm being encouraged to take to the foot of Negro Mountain. I've been to Negro Mountain actually many, many times. It's a very interesting place. <laughs> 
Uh, Jacqueline, um, how do you decide if it's a quilt or a poem? Um, it's a different type of visioning. I, I can't write the poem unless I see it somewhere in my mind's eye. Um, it's a different kind of energy. Um, I, I, I used to just work very blindly. Now I will sit and plan a quilt for, for weeks, maybe months at a time before I sit down the show. By the time I'm sewing, that's the end of it. That's the end of, well, it's not the end, but I will have been at research, gathering fabric, play, you know, taping things to my living room wall, looking at stuff, drawing things. Um, and then I start working. It's, it's a really different process. Yeah, interesting. Can I ask how long does it take you to make a quilt? Because it's such an embodied experience. I'm just sort of wondering. Um, Sometimes, sometimes I can execute something in a week. And then there's the thing that I drag around for months and months. <laughs> and I'm, I'm the queen of the 11th hour. So if I have an exhibit, I'm basically finishing it the night before I put it in the mail. Uh, <laughs> I never, ever get that right. Um, but I usually spend like a month typically um just just because i'm thinking things out and and looking at fabric mm -hmm. cool dj what is your next project we didn't get around all of us talking about our next project oh, yeah well i'm um i have three projects because it took me 15 years to write my book so in the meantime i have three other manuscripts that basically need about you know six months each one is about wow. the arctic about the north pole and uh, a period of estrangement with my daughter. So it's about loss, but also uh, reconciliation and, you know, what happens when uh, a broken relationship is mended, both with the earth and with a, a daughter. Um, and then, yeah, the others are, I just won't even go into them, but that's, yeah, I have, I have to decide. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you. Um, why the sturgeon? Oh yeah, why the sturgeon? Well, I've always loved sturgeons. I find them fascinating. I mean, just look at these things, right? So, um, you know, the ancientness, these dinosaurs. I just love the dinosaurial survivors at the bottom of the lake. I'm, I love swimming. I swim as much as I can. That's the one place where my body does not hurt it's in the water. So I've had a strong relationship to being in our beautiful bodies of water here. And then there's, yeah, survivors. Also, I got to know sturgeon revitalization programs when I went um, to a number of them around, um, you know, near, near Sault Ste. Marie. And then also in Detroit, there's a sturgeon revitalization program. And there's one really near to where I'm here right now. The Grand Traverse Band has a revitalization program. So I love the small sturgeons, you know, they just, they look amazing, super cute. <laughs> and then they, they live forever. And then it's these giant, big, surviving ancient dinosaurs with their barbels. You know, I also love the idea that the sense organs are hanging beneath the face. You know, there's this, this very touchily, sensory thing, which really speaks to me as a somatic person. You know, the notion that there's sensing through touch that's facial. I just, I, there's just so many, I could go on for a long time. I also have a novel called The Sturgeon, which one of these days, you know, has to find, has to find a home. I don't know. It's a speculative fiction story about um, people moving from, uh, from Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Lovecraft's place, obviously, right? So move um, <laughs> in the, to the St. Lawrence waterway with this creature that is just very interestingly engaged with uh, this particular um, lesbian story um that's that's moving moving along like um uh like a picaresque uh, journey along along the land so it's been super fun to write that actually <laughs> um, okay. um so we have yeah we have one um um question and well i'll direct it to orchid um how is your relationship to the place that you're writing about from changed in our present moment of endless video chats? And this is a, I, I have to say, Orchid, I loved your poem so much. And I love your book. I just adore it. I love, 
I love all the way that you thread all that historical with the yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you're you're a genius. Oh. But, <laughs> question for you because you you run um you know the off topics poetics yeah so i'm i'm su i'm super interested in place and site specific specificity obviously because i'm a new zealander in um in the middle of nowhere of ohio and it's very strange it's very eerie um but i i find that even though you know we live in online spaces we're still very much grounded in a real world and an actual in an actual space where we breathe air and we touch real things and we are still very much physically in the world and i think that's really important to be mindful that just because poetry might seem disembodied and floating around in cyberspace um it's very much real and in the world and physical it has its own materiality so i mean place is so vital i think to my poetics i mean i was but my book it's out you know the, a year of misreading the wildcats was very much grounded around um around philadelphia and pennsylvania but now now ohio is just so beautiful and amazing and um eerie and I'm eerie as an A-I-R-Y. Um, and I think even though I incorporate a lot of history, there's such an interdependence of spaces and places. Um, I don't know. I just don't, I think, I think we put a lot of stock in online spaces as being, as being somewhat disembodied, but it's so physical. Yeah. yeah. I just can I just also say though, like I I wanted to read that poem because I know that Cecil had has a very has a connection to Ohio. So I read that for 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 basically you because oh, also you. also I'm a, I'm a fangirl, so I, I love your work. Oh, you're so sweet, thank you. <laughs> can I get a copy of it? Is that in the? Oh, is that, um, the poem is that? Oh, this actually, it's, um, this was published in an anthology, um, but I can actually, I can definitely send you a copy. Would you please? Yeah. Sure. Well, let's, let's connect and I would love to, I'd love to talk more. <laughs> well, um, thank everybody. We've, you know, people have just been so great uh, hanging on here for an hour and a half, listening to us, sharing this time with us. I'll let um Petra um wrap it up since she's wrapped up all of our readings so far and then we'll hand the baton once and for all to Jacqueline so Petra. yes because then we're done so <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody for being part of this it has just been wonderful to be part of these four series um these four readings in the series We've started this in May. Um, we were just at the beginning of the pandemic. So much has been going on. And Orchid, I so um, relate to your sense of speaking about the embodiedness even of these Zoom worlds. We have found so much friendship and connection through these readings. These readings and sister readings around the place, right, are the, the eco-poetics readings that's, that, that are just coming to an end tomorrow. So if anybody wants to read more or listen to more eco-poetry work tomorrow, there's um, uh, the eco-poetic reading series is, is concluding. On, on last Wednesday, the Zooglossia Disabled um, Poets reading concluded. So we've, we've just had these strong, and of course, your own Distancia, the Distancia work is going on. So I, I love the Distancia. Uh, mm -hmm. video readings. So there's been this really wonderful level of support that went on so far throughout the pandemic. And I hope that for many of the people who've listened to us that this has been part of your support system. And I am just so excited about Jacqueline's uh, new adventure. So I think I actually should hand the last word to Jacqueline so she can tell us about the next issue. Would that be okay? Oh, sure. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm just glad that you both started it. Um, I want to say that the new issue of About Place Journal is in production right now. Um, it's dedicated to works of resistance and resilience. Um, and we had an enormous response to the call for work. And we received 
responses from people across the USA, but also across the globe. Um, I was really not prepared for that. So it's been very, very interesting and just some wonderful, powerful work. Um, and I worked with two editors, uh, Vita James and Ifuna Fulani. Mm -hmm. And um, between the three of us, we've, we've um, gone through, I don't know how many thousands of pages. Um, um, but we have a, a, a fine combination of established writers and new voices and, and really some fierce, fierce work. Um, just really wonderful, fierce work. Um, I can't wait to see the new issue. Um, I want to thank Michael McDermott and Jesse Hughes for working with me on it. Um, we're still beginning our journey in the production phase, so I hope we're all still talking at the end. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so far, so good. So I'm going I'm to leave it like that. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to this new issue. We're, we're focusing on, we got a lot of work on resistance and a tremendous amount of work on the pandemic. Um, we have uh, a section called Notions of Home and Borders. And then we have... Uh, I, I, we didn't call it climate change, but that's basically the theme of it. And then we have a, a huge section, a huge section on uh, resilience. Um, um, who knew that? I think when the, the call went out, the feeling was that, oh, by the fall, we'll be done with the pandemic. And not so. <laughs> but anyway, I think you're in, you'll be in for a pleasant surprise. We were, we were thinking re resistance, but not in the narrow frame and not the predictable frame. So I think it'll be, be an interesting issue. Look, looking forward to it, looking forward to sharing it with everyone and, and to starting or continuing uh, this series with just a different name <laughs> and a different group of people. Um, okay, well, well thank we say goodbye to the um, our audience. And thank you, DJ, for being wonderful. Thank you, DJ. Bye.